live. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. So hello, everyone. My name is Lily Balog, and uh, I am a board member of Agroecology Europe and the coordinator of the Hungarian Agroecology Network and a farmer in northern Hungary. And I will be the moderator for today's session with some lovely speakers that we have uh, the opportunity to have together with us today. And we will be talking about the agri different agroecological approaches in formal and non-formal education. So the session will look like that we will have five presentations from all over Europe, and then we will open the floor for the questions. So if you have any questions, please write them in the comments there on the right side of the screen. We will collect them and we will ask them at the, at the end of the five presentations. So without further ado, I would like to present our first speaker, who is Paola Migliorini. And Paola is the president of Agroecology Europe and the vice president of IFOM Agrobio Mediterraneo. She's a professor and a researcher at the University of Gastronomic Sciences, where she also coordinates a master in agroecology and food sovereignty. Migliorini is an agronomist with a master in food security and PhDs in organic and sustainable agriculture. She authored over 100 technical and scientific publications concerning agroecological models, which enhance biodiversity and soil fertility, along with innovative pedagogical methodologies and participatory system thinking. So, Paola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lily, for the presentation. Um, I'm going to share with you... Um, yes, I'm going... Uh, okay. Um, the result of a next food project uh, that is uh, basically the... Just a moment. Can you see my screen? Sorry, I need uh, just because I don't see the others. Do you see my screen? Hello. <laughs> okay, I will go on. I yes, Paula, we see your screen. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to present um, um, the result of a uh, research project that. Uh, uh, we are carrying out as uh, University of Gastronomic Science together with many other partners that is called NextFood, educating the next generation of professionals in the agri-food system. The, the general idea is to look at sustainability of our planet as a, as a whole. No? So let's say um, we, we are in a very uh, difficult uh, realities uh, where uh, we compare now that are really rich country and, and uh, Poor countries and, and food, of course, is in the center of this, uh, this inequality no? with, uh, with um, famine and uh, obesity. No? So the, the, the two, uh, um, yeah, this equilibrium related to our society. And um, so Nextwood is an international project founded by Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Framework Program. Uh, that drives the circular transition to sustainable and competitive agri uh, food system and forestry, in particular, implementing education and training to prepare the future professional with competence, not to push the green shift that is needed and that this morning we were quoting you know, a lot, uh, in particular for Europe, but for all over the world. Um, education is also one of the of the uh, SDG, you not know, the Sustainable Development Goal, in particular the SDG number four that call for quality education. And the aim is to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So this idea that education do not finish when we get out from school, no, but is accompany uh, us for the whole life. On the other hand, teaching does not necessarily lead to learning, as my colleague and friend Guy Leblin uh, somehow, yeah, uh, uh, I, I acquired this from him. No, so um, and so we need to activate other tools in order to uh, foster, not to develop this capability. So the project is a um, uh, quite large project: nineteen partners, thirteen countries, three continents for four years. And um, the objective of this project that is almost at the end um, is to generate an innovative European science and education roadmap for sustainable agriculture and forest you know, along the value chain. Um, and we have many objectives. I'm not going to read all of them, but in general is to focus on case studies in order to develop skills and competence. So to provide uh, curricula and training methods uh, as well as policy instruments 
in order to develop knowledge sharing, okay? The, the, the consortium agreed on, on using a methodology based on case studies, uh, and we use as a reference the action learning model applied from uh, Guy Leben et al., which seek to generate a close link between the university that generally is very, you know, academic discipline with, with the silos in, in, in separation, no, with discipline, and society that uh, society for, for definition or no, reality is complex and, and is transdisciplinary per se. So the idea is to develop uh, uh, through transformative and participatory learning model a collaborative action-oriented learning where we put uh, uh, a safe space, where we develop a safe space uh, where teacher, advisor, stakeholder, student uh, um, co-develop and co-design no? dialogue, observation, reflection, participation, and visioning that are the five core competences. So from a linear mob model, we want to shift uh, to an experiential approach. So experiential learning is not, of course, new. It is uh, very well placed in, uh, in a lot of uh, um, official uh, no, paper, document, uh, books, uh, and as well, no, also ac academic no, level. So it is, is the path no, to learning, to, to develop knowledge when we base our, um, when, when we have the ability to reflect on our exp experience. No? It is come from different approach, classical, classical participatory pedagogy, popular education, no? the, 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 the work of Paul Freire and so on as well as the radical agroecology, not Kloppenberg, Francis, and Mendes. So the, the, the next project basically um, want to shift no, from a linear teacher uh, to that, that teach, no, that uh, provide lecture, you know, direct uh, knowledge to student, the learner, to another uh, system where uh, there is a circular, uh, circular approach uh, and this is based uh, on, on case development. So there are hindering forces, uh, forces that, uh, um, that um, do not allow no, this transition and supporting force that help us to do that. So the core uh, competence, no, the, 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 the idea is to develop, to, to focus the knowledge, the, 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 uh, yeah, the, the, the training on competence development and a competence is defined as a functionally linked complex of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So it's not just no, the, the, uh, the ability to do something, but it's more uh, complex. And uh, as I already said, uh, we concentrated on five core competences, the ability of participation, observation, dialogue, visioning, and uh, reflection. Um, the project have uh, several uh, working pa package, but again, I don't want to focus on the project. I want to focus on the uh, results. So, for example, the work package one uh, uh, identify what are the most important skills, no? the inventory of skills. And this is we have gathered through different focus group and online questionnaire to different kind of stakeholder. The work package to identify a list of uh, case studies, so the results uh, about implementation of teaching in different case studies. The case studies we have mm, uh, shared are 12, and in particular today I will very shortly present the result of case 8, uh, that is my university, the university I work with, uh, the experiential and action learning on eco-gastronomy. In, 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 in this university, in, this, uh, in, in my... In my Home University, we have applied the concept in three different, uh, um, let's say, environments. So an undergraduate program, um, uh, in particular the second year, um, a short course on agroecology and sustainable agriculture uh, within the Master of Gastronomy. And the third level, we have developed a whole course, a whole program, uh, one year master in agroecology and food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So very briefly, again, in order to shift from a linear teaching to a cyclical learning, um, we need to apply uh, to, to develop different shift. And in particular, we identify six areas. So for example, from a lecture hall to a diversity of learning arenas, from a frontal lecture to co and peer learning, from syllabus, no, from a book to diversity of learning source, from textbook to diversity of teaching aids, 
from written exam to diversity of assessment. This is for me, it was the, always the most critical one from lecture to learning facilitator. Mm -hmm. So these are some examples. For example, we, we use different tools. Uh, um, Rich Picture is a very nice and important tool that we have uh, developed a lot, uh, as well as a comparison between initial question from the student to the final question of the student. So how they change the approach when they go on developing the, the, the program and the course. Uh, we, we ask the student to develop individual reflection document where they reflect about their own experiential learning, as well as stakeholder document and a lot of, uh, for example, group presentation and, and activity in the farm. Um, at the UNIS, we have many, many study trips uh, where we try to develop year after year uh, the five core competence. Um, and in general, we, we for example, divide not the more uh, classical uh, experiential learning, so the farm visit or the, or the producer visit uh, with a preparation phase and a final uh, evaluation session. Um, then we have also analyzed uh, the, the statistically the self-assessment, so they, the students are requested to self-assess their own um, competence develop and we have uh, uh, actually also some some quantitative and statistical results so it's also nice when we compare qualitative approach with some uh, uh, quantitative approach and in particular the year 2018 19 and 20 we have uh, analyzed uh, 126 uh, stu 100 and 125 students from 31 countries um, and we also compare the in-presence approach with the last year, the online approach. Uh, I'm going to, to conclude. The most important effort for us was the one-year master program in uh, agroecology and food sovereignty, so-called MAFS. Uh, the the one-year master program is, div is divided in four modules. We have the food sovereignty module, the sustainable food system module, the agroecosystem module, and the action experiential learning approach as a module per se, where the student um, basically explore the pedagogical approach. Uh, it was a journey because we have worked uh, one year and a half before the, the development of it, the opening of it uh, uh, with the partner, with the project partner, as well as former student, uh, also technician, uh, slow food community, farmers community. So a lot of colleagues from all over the world into workshop. And what we did is we uh, reflect ourselves, uh, for example, what must the student know and be able to do in order to become agroecologist to meet and fulfill the needs you know, for the case studies in the community because the students spend three months in a community. So what they need to know before they go there and what they will develop. So we have this four phase approach uh, basically six months are in, in, in Polenzo where they explore different uh, uh, themes, uh, subject, but also, for example, they do every week, they spend uh, one day in a garden or in a farm, and then they leave for three months approach. This is for three months uh, in a community, in a farm, basically all over the world, um, alone or with a little group of two and three. And there they develop their own research question. There they gather, no? they, they explore the situation and then they come back to finalize the thesis and present and defend the thesis. Uh, last year, it was the first year we had uh, 16 uh, students from different country and it was also the COVID uh, year. So there was a lot of restriction in action learning because a lot of things we had to put it online, but I think we were successful in, in doing that because, as I told you, we measure, we were able to um, to evaluate their competence development and it was positive for all of them. Um, those are a list of community we have, um, the student have uh, uh, visited for three months, uh, um, so it's very engaging for them. Uh, and they, they work uh, and together with the farm, with the community, as well as developing their own research approach. And final uh, reflection is, of course, to develop this kind of approach in a university. There are some obstacles. In particular, uh, there is the need of uh, institutional support um, and flexibility that, of course, is not so obvious in a formal uh, 
no, program. Um, but um, for, for us, uh, for the group that uh, together with me developed this, uh, this project was uh, extremely uh, satisfactory. Okay, I, I stop here and uh, maybe uh, I can be available later on for a question and answer if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paola. Indeed, you have already received uh, some questions, but as I said at the beginning, I will be reading the questions at the end, and so therefore you can reflect on each other as well. So our next presenter will be Sara Suezarin from the Bjorn University. Sara has a master's in agricultural sciences and sustainability, and she did some studies on conservation of indigenous breeds of animals. Recently, she has been working as a freelance consultant for the International Agricultural Policies Forum in Hamburg to raise awareness of uh, environmental issues for pupils and children. Reaching people through their children was the issue of her independent research. She applied pedagogical approaches to promote education for environmental topics, such as agrobiodiversity. She is also a volunteer consul consultant at German Zero, an initiative working with experts, scientists, and citizens to develop a 1.5 degree legislative package to reach the climate neutrality of Germany by 2035. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Lily, and thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me as a speaker, and thanks for this great event. Actually, it's the first time which I'm taking part, and. Um, I'm really glad to be here and be part of that. Uh, so as uh, Lily mentioned, I studied agricultural science and uh, sustainable agriculture, actually. And I was actually a scientist at the university. And then at one stage, I decided to go to the bottom of society, actually in the middle of the society or the, even the, at the bottom of society. Uh, to reach people, you know, to reach uh, everyone at the society. So I've been uh, working for a while since 2016 uh, as an environmental education. And uh, in the field of environmental education, mostly at the schools. Uh, so uh, I go to schools and directly talk to the kids. Uh, uh, actually, I'm working for one organization which they are coordinate our work and uh, uh, I go to schools and having workshop with the kids uh, and we have many uh, different methods for uh, transfer the knowledge which we have uh, to the kids. Um, Actually, I like interaction works with the kid because it's, uh, it's very, very, very amazing to hear and to listen how they think of uh, agroecological agri or even agriculture and so on. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a variety of topics which we work with the kids, uh, but mostly, of course, of, uh, on sustain sustainable agriculture. And, uh, for example, interaction between uh, agriculture and climate change, uh, footprint, as carbon footprint and agrobiodiversity, uh, agricultural policies and trade and so on. Uh, I work with uh, different, I mean, I mean, different children, different ages from kindergarten to, to pre-university. And uh, and each level at each stage of school, uh, we have different methods. So, for example, at the kindergarten, um, we uh, I work with the raised bed gardens uh, to get the little kids in contact with the soil, actually, and with the food, which actually how the food grows, and. Uh, 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 also through nature, I mean, going to the nature directly and show them, and um, with the and with the kids at the high school, uh, we also have uh, different uh, methods of uh, education, uh, like playing a role or PowerPoint presentation videos, group works on games. Um, um, my observation uh, is that the most of the people, uh, the most of the students and children, children at school, uh, they are not aware of where the food comes from. 
actually the big lag of uh, education on agriculture topic on agroecological topics uh, especially i mean i work in german schools so this is my observation from german schools and uh, uh, I had an independent research on how these uh, school kids reach their parents and raising the awareness of environmentally uh, topics. Uh, actually, my observation or my independent research says that uh, the kids can affect their family and raise the awareness. Uh, and I had a very good examples and uh, I mean, I haven't published any results or any statistics, but I uh, I did some questioning and get really good feedback that the kids can raise awareness of their family on uh, environmental topics. And uh, they are really uh, aware to learn. And as I mentioned, their lack of the agriculture uh, education in the schools. Um, so while this uh, consultancy in the schools and being energetic at the bottom of society, I really realized the demand of uh, knowledge transformation in formal and non-formal level. I also work uh, on a non-formal level and uh, for, I hold workshops on the um, street food festivals or any other event to raise awareness about environmentally topics and especially food and uh, uh, how the making decision on eating this food or not can affect the uh, climate and uh, nowadays with the topic of climate change uh, is uh, really everyone it's everyone on the street is uh, reachable to be talked about and uh, we had also uh, I mean, we uh, as a little uh, town which I'm living in, uh, we have from German Zero, German Zero is a initiative organization which trying to uh, reduce the carbon emissions and uh, try to, through reaching people, actually affect the political and decision makers. Uh, so, as I said, um, uh, in this uh, matter of uh, uh, non-formal education, uh, we also have really good uh, good uh, results. Actually, reaching people, uh, yeah. And uh, at the end of, I can say, I can conclude it that uh, this is the hard work to work directly with the people, with the kids, and uh, but it's something which you get. I mean, really, immediately the direct uh, the effect, and uh, uh, I'm really happy that I can work in, in in this field and transfer the knowledge which I got from university directly to the people in, the, in the, every level of society. Um, so thank you so much, and I'm also open to any kind of questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. If you have any questions for Sarah, please write them in the comments section and then we will read it. I will read them out loud to her uh, later on when we are answering the questions. So our next presenter will be Laia Walls from the Syndicate of Periodistas de Catalunya. She's a journalist specialized in gender with a professional certification in organic farming. She has been editor in chief in a non-daily press in the Economic Sunday supplement El Centim and a monographic magazine, Don's Dossier, Dossier sorry, of the Association of Women Journalists, uh, among others. She has also worked in communication in the third sector, and she has always combined her work with activism, both feminist and ecologist, and more recently in the defense of the right to information and the labor rights of the professionals with the jour journalist Union of Catalonia. She participates in the forum on behalf of the SPC, so the Union of Journalists of Catalonia, so, and the Union of Communication Professionals of Catalonia. So thank you, Laia, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organization to invite us to, to talk about uh, journalism and right to information in this, in this forum. Um, and 
uh, well, I, I had some, some issues with the technological uh, meanings. So I, I had a presentation for you, but I, I, I think it's not uh, even necessary to, to give you um, the main, main idea uh, about uh, what, why a uh, uh, union of journalists uh, is in this presentation. No? And first of all, I, I would like also to, to thank to, to the City Council of Barcelona because in the, in, during the um, Sustainable Food Week, uh, we had uh, a, a conversation in Plaza Real in Barcelona about uh, right to information and food sovereignty with uh, two great professionals from journalism and from agriculture, organic agriculture. And we, we want to bring this uh, issue, this, uh, this important message of the, the importance for citizenship uh, to defend the right to information to the right to independent and re reliable uh, information in any in any public discussion, because without uh, re re reliable and uh, true information, we cannot defend any other right. So uh, we we have this uh, comparison between both uh, food and information sectors, and uh, they are uh, parallel. They are they are both very mercantilized or commodified. Uh, for example, in the management model, we have a great concentration of companies in both sectors. In the consumption model, we have a fast consumption of food and information. So the fake news. You agree with me that are fast news. <laughs> um, also, the opacity in traceability. So, from where do we have um, this uh, food, or from where do we have this news? Who who worked in it, and in which uh, in in which conditions? Uh, in both sectors, we have this opacity. We don't know anything about who produces the information or the food. Also, the precariousness uh, in both uh, little, uh, little companies or, or the, the person who, who works in these sectors, we are in front of uh, monocultures that get, mm, leaves us in a very precarious situation. And the difficulty of access, uh, we, especially for people that doesn't have, that don't, don't have uh, a lot of economic meaning. So to be fast, we, we presented the issue of the food sovereignty because it's our, no, our, our main goal in, in this uh, sustainability. Also because the, the, from, from the perspective of organic producers like uh, Ariana Temoleda, who was in our, in our uh, conference in Barcelona, we are not in a sustainability situation anymore, but we have to regenerate, no? and this is what we need. But in the same time, we do we have any information from the city? Do we know about uh, food sovereignty, or or people do do we know the relationship between uh, food and climate change? And we have a situation where um, there are some taboos in the, in the information, and we start now. Uh, hearing about the growth or the limit of growth, but it has been a, a very taboo um, since uh, was 40 years ago. And uh, on the other side, on the other hand, we, we have uh, the, the, the role of media. Which, which role has journalism in this world uh, now? Uh, we know, uh, uh, we, we cannot deny that media construct reality. And um, we, we talked about this in, in gender, we talk about this in any, any, in any um, uh, 
ambit of our society. So also in in the in the food and and in agroecology, you know? and in theory, social objectives of journalism are to control power, to give uh, to give voice to those voices that power doesn't want to hear, uh, and also very important to link the uh, global data to the local and concrete uh, facts to to help people to to understand the the, the world we live in you know? and uh, and also uh, this this uh, this role of uh, journalism out in social in in the in the society uh, we can see that uh, for example we we asked that in in rural world uh, we we have an omnipresence of big companies, agri food companies, in our information and in our journals, in our um, mainstream media, where uh, is omnipresence this uh, produced information. So it it generates confusion, confusion. Um, it uh, and we can talk about this. Uh, and also, it it pro, um, provocates that um, little producers uh, cannot be heard, even in in the rural world or even between the the, the producers. No, the the organic producers, little producers, are normally uh, in silence in front of these big uh, companies with their um, press offices. So. Uh, if we if we consider that food sovereignty is the ability to decide what we eat and how we produce it, uh, and in order to make decisions, we need uh, people need knowledge and space for reflection. Uh, we if we don't have uh, proven and truthful information, it's not possible to defend this uh, this food sovereignty. In, and neither any any other right. So why are we here? As a, or what what uh, do the the Union of Journalists of Catalonia defend? Are these good practices, for example, that uh, media uh, have have uh, taken as the the garden that didn't didn't accept anymore uh, the the advertising from great big. Uh, Contaminant uh, companies, for example, or to to the the initiatives of talking about emergency, climate emergency, more than the euphemism of uh, climate change or whatever. No? So we defend in our proposals, as um, other other uh, colleagues uh, of mine talked about in in this conversation, is that there is an, uh, a need of a food literacy. That is a, a concept that uh, Gustavo Duc used in an article, and, and I think it's very, very um, significant because we we need to learn uh, what is food and how to consume uh, to eat uh, local and seasonal uh, food, um, and know people that produce this food, and also we propose and we need. Uh, media literacy because we 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 have to have the citizenship need tools and awareness to demand proven rigorous and truthful information without this we are lost we 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 are um, we are, they are selling us information not information informating people and we we gave some some resources and ideas of, uh, for example, to observe the signature of the news and in sh to be sure that it is not one of the interested parties, for example, to know if this news is, is uh, independent uh, or, for example, the, the information sources, to see which information sources are used in the article, for example, and uh, to look for independent uh, media that are not uh, controlled by banks or large multinationals. So our proposals as well as a Union of Journalists, is, and I will finish with this, 
is that we defend the regulation of the right of information because without any regulation is the market and the neoliberal um, ro um, rules that are uh, selling us the information. And so we, uh, as a union of workers in the information sector, we defend the, the right, the, the working, the working rights of uh, workers in media because only by this way we can have uh, independence and quality of work of journalists so we uh, we can guarantee the citizenship uh, the citizenship uh, right to information and we ask for the regulation of a law that we have in Spain and in Catalonia that is the, the right of information law in the Constitución Española and in the Estatut de Autonomía de Catalunya, that we have an article, the uh, 52 article, which is uh, defending the right of uh, information, but it has never been developed. So we don't have any law, any, any re regulation of this right. So it's like it doesn't exist. And we, we think it's very related, to, uh, related with the sustainable and uh, uh, right of food and sovereignty. Thank you very much. I was very, very fast, but if you want to ask or, or comment, um, we will be very happy to, to share some ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laia. It was indeed very interesting. And our fourth speaker will be Melinda Koshai from Hungary who is original psychotherapist and works since 2006 on sustainability and local organizations. Uh, she has been an expert on the, of the UN development program at the regional office in Bratislava. And for 12 years, she was the head of professional development at a small NGO based in Hungary, which was called Butterfly, or which is still called Butterfly Development. And it's uh, based in a, one of the poorest region in Hungary. More recently, she has been working as an independent sustainability and agroecology as, expert. Her main activities are non-formal education, designing and training, and communication. And she's very interested in the movement pillar of agroecology. Not only interested, but quite active, as she's also a part of the Hungarian Agroecology Network. So Melinda, the floor is yours. OK. This, uh... Uh, you can see me. I will also try to uh, share my screen at the main time. Um, um, this I I would like to uh, talk about an um, agroecological initiative, which is um, uh, which is in a small um, town of uh, Hungary. I don't think I can do this sharing now while talking. In a small town of uh, Hungary, um, east uh, part of Hungary, and it is uh, the mostly um, aim of this um, activity is food uh, literacy, shall I say. And uh, it is uh, based on uh, on an quite a long uh, ongoing uh, agroecological activity, which, uh, which goes on since uh, more than 10 years in the town, actually. It's uh, developed their um, own uh, community-based uh, organically certified farm with um, four hectares of uh, vegetable growing uh, and uh, also uh, animal um, animals with traditional indigenous uh, animals uh, which were uh, there before um, before the second war basically and um, and uh, the uh, idea was also that um, trying to create a local um, economy where it's um, where it's some um, circular patterns can, can be there. There's, there is also local money in the town. Also, people can um, um, develop their own products and uh, market. Uh, and it is, was uh, economically quite uh, successful. It also um, um, contributed to the um, local uh, schools, uh, um, 
lunch programma, a big part of the food is used there, and other part is, uh, is, uh, is uh, you can buy it on the market. But the realization was still that, uh, that the local um, inhabitants uh, are not quite um, aware of, uh, of issues of food security and food sovereignty and the importance of all of it. And this program is, um, is, uh, is a combination of um, uh, non-formal education and uh, food literacy, basically. Um, the target group is, um, is uh, students of between 14 and 18 years uh, old. And the idea is that, uh, that uh, they will be uh, trained as guides uh, in, the, in the ecological site. Uh, and uh, when they are trained, then they will be able to, to, um, to receive uh, visitors, uh, visitors from the town itself and, uh, and also from uh, the neighboring towns. And um, behind, the, behind this, the idea is that uh, this can be also a contribution for sustainable tourism and also outdoor activities. Um, this year was, uh, was a very strange one, of course, for everyone. But um, what we saw that, uh, that because so many things were uh, closed uh, down because of the COVID, this uh, outdoor um, activities were uh, quite popular um, uh, on the side of the tourists. Uh, and, uh, and that is uh, what we would like uh, to go on um, with this, uh, and um, we will see whether is it possible that um, that later um, also encourages people for um, um, starting on uh, um, gardening and 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 sharing experiences. Uh, uh, if it is possible, then I can send you the uh, somehow this PPT which I pres uh, um, made. Uh, for this, then um, you can go through it, and um, and then um, then you can also ask questions. I am not sure whether is it possible here to attach uh, every anything. Do you know it? Can I attach here something or not? Hi, Melinda. I think it's not possible to do it right here, but we can share the presentation. We can okay. upload it afterwards in a separate okay, area. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda. And last but not least, we're getting to our last presentation, which will be a co-production of uh, three people, but unfortunately only two of them will be present. It will be given by Michael Lubman, Maike Hapel, who is not here, unfortunately, and Fatima Lenhart, who will be with us. So let me present you the two presenters who will be here with us today. So the first one is Michael Lubman, who is a team-oriented agroecosystems researcher for systemic ecological interactions on the farm and landscape level. He tries to set milestones for sustainable development within food production and landscape development, aiming at increased provision of ecosystem services. Through inter- and transdisciplinary research, cutting across disciplines, institutions and countries, he organizes his work with a holistic perspective to identify and solve systemic root causes of problem solutions. And Fatima will be here with us as well. And Fatima is currently working at ZALF. Her research topic focuses on environmental economics and sustainability. She worked as a professor for agricultural economics at National School of Agriculture in Morocco and as a postdoctoral researcher at Göttingen University. She obtained her engineering degree in rural economics, her master's in agri-food marketing, her DEA in applied e economics, her PhD from uh, Spain, and habilitation degree in economic sciences in from Fez University. So welcome both of you, and hopefully Micah will be joining us one day as well. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, yes. Uh, and thank you to the audience for joining today. So um, today it's uh, we are going a bit out of the scene of the education now, but it's a bit uh, going a step ahead basically. So what can you do once you have uh, an education in agroecology? Um, are the slides still online or I can see them? Sorry, wait a second. I will put them back on. I was not sharing them properly. My... Ah, 
<laughs> okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> No, so basically what can you do when once you have actually studied, for example, agroecology and one option is agroecological research, because research is uh, actually an, in, yeah, you can call it an industry, but there's a lot of money in research. And uh, of course, that can help us to make an agroecological transition. So are there slides online now? So just that I know. I don't see the slides, so that's why I'm asking. <clears throat> Sorry, um, I'm having some problems at the moment. I will share them. Give me a minute. Okay, so wait, sorry. I can also try Maybe to share them. Then it's. Michael, you can yeah, try I will to make it... share them. Um, ba -bum. So, now you should see the slides. Good. <clears throat> So basically, uh, there's a lot of initiatives coming up right now in uh, agroecological research. And we have, especially on the European level, but not only, of course, I only picked out a few here that are the main initiatives. So we have the Horizon Europe mission uh, on soil health and food, it was formerly called. Now it's the Soil Deal for Europe. And there's a lot of uh, parallels to agroecological initiatives in there. It's also a lot of a lot based on the Living Labs and Lighthouse concept, which I will describe later on. We have the um, Standing Committee for Agricultural Research on Agroecology, and they are forming a partnership proposal amongst uh, European countries <clears throat> in order to promote an agroecological transition. We have the Horizon 2020 project already and the Horizon 2020 project Agroecology for EU, which are also trying to promote uh, agroecology, a lot of them actually through the Living Labs and Lighthouse concept. And uh, <clears throat> basically we have research, um, research and innovation that is coming up now in institutes, but uh, as I said, in Living Labs and Lighthouses, and this is uh, the Living Labs and Lighthouse concept is a bit vague, still defined, it's getting better actually, but it it means basically action-oriented research where you co-develop uh, knowledge together with practitioners and stakeholders. So this is uh, one of the big initiatives on the EU level right now. But however, if we want to upscale agroecology, research to these levels we need to institu institutionalize a bit more in, uh, because i mean agroecology is a broad concept which is good but if you want to get these large amounts of funding i think we have to have a better definitional understanding also of, of what agroecology is which uh, was lately done a lot by the fao and uh, other organizations of course and uh, also we need to define what is agroecological research then um, <clears throat> so agroecology the big difference to the more conventional research concepts is actually that uh, people are seen as a part of nature instead of uh, being a side of nature and that leads, uh, that leads by itself to the following question so it's a holistic approach where we try to include people in our research on how to solve for example environmental problems how to solve agronomic problems and it also includes the socio-economic um, environment as part of the ecosystem and not just as a thing that is a side of nature so it is actually in the middle of it if you want so um, <clears throat> we have more holistic methodologies we have uh, we include the we try to have a full overview of the system instead of focusing on very specific parts of a system for example um, <clears throat> we aim at the root cause of a problem instead of for example symptoms because often we try to solve symptoms rather than the cause of a problem uh, we have interactive research, we try to include the stakeholders, we have bilateral communication, so we have actually up and down communication. Researchers go in the field, talk with practitioners, talk with stakeholders and try to learn from them and likewise the people learn from the researchers. So it's uh, basically you have also a raising of re uh, awareness raising is already part of the research if you want. So. And the research questions need to be adapted accordingly, of course. And this is one of the key problems that we have at the moment, because uh, right now um, the research funding schemes usually don't allow for bigger adaptations of research questions within a project. And I think here the methodology is key. So how do I get to these questions, uh, to the research questions? And here we need to improve quite a lot, I think. <clears throat> And we need to actually change the role of research is just producing knowledge towards um, like research as an active means of transition and not just a passive means. Uh, we need to really get into these positions where we say, OK, we actually guide the change on the spot where it happens. And the research itself becomes then an instrument of an iterative process towards an improvement or towards an agroecological transition in our case. Um, there's a lot of methods, of course. Um, 
and agroecological research. I don't want to go into depth, but a lot of them include, for example, that we need to find uh, situation, situation tailored mixes of methods rather than ad hoc solutions. We also want to have action research and problem analysis. So we need to find out what is the cause of a problem. We um, <clears throat> We can make timelines, rich pictures, flowcharts, when diagrams, like all of these tools basically to get an, a broad overview of a system in order to define the research questions for then doing specific research or, for example, also to do co-creational research. And of course, the participatory and action research, for example, in living labs and lighthouses, which will come in the following years. Okay, um, from here, uh, Fatima will take over. So. Uh, thank you, Mikhail, and hey, hey everyone. I'm glad to be here for the first time. So here we're we'll speaking about agroecological education. Formal, non-formal and informal is central to agroecology. This can take many different forms and many different levels, including farmers, uh, policymakers, researchers and consumers. So if we look at uh, to the agroecological farmers, the farm to farm learning and sharing approach for example, known as popular education, plays an important role in scaling up agroecology. An example of these approaches is a farm, uh, farmer field schools developed by uh, FAO and includes uh, extensionists and researchers uh, along with farmers in a uh, horizontal process and it's based in farmer experimenting in their own field, share results and lesson learned. For researchers, the complex challenge of a tran transdisciplinary approach of agroecology offers a high innovative learning process. The holistic approaches that include environmental, economic and social spheres require well-developed skills to learn and teach. Um, for the policymakers, the agroecological knowledge based and sharing experiences and lessons between countries can be used to take decisions to face climate changes and create a more resilient food system. The consumers. The consumers are the key stakeholders inside the food system since their choices can impact positively or negatively the agroecological production. So it is important to increase the consumer awareness regarding multiple benefits of agroecology and promote the consumption of local sustainable food throughout the communication uh, of the advantage linked to the agroecological product. The next slide, please, Mikhail. So, in conclusion, there is a need for transition. First, there is needs uh, for the individual uh, within the system uh, through uh, broad agroecological education, which means more expertise with, uh, within agroecology in a broad scale, advanced training for established researcher with power for decisions such as professors, institution leaders, and other professionals that need to acquire a fundamental understanding of agroecological concepts and research and to be able to uh, understand and accept related processes and also initiate and implement necessary changes. Uh, research career perspective for agroecologists, agro there is a need for solid career perspective that go beyond the idealistic vision of wanting to improve the world. So agroecologists need uh, opportunities to get into jobs with decision power uh, throughout the creation of more jobs in agroecological research and also the revision of the reward system. So the focus need to be not just scientific publication, but rather in the application of created knowledge and guidance of an actual transition. Uh, the next, please, uh, hi. So, um, on other side, there is also a systemic, a systemic, a systemic needs. So needed changes in the research systems level in relation to in relation to the last need of a new reward system we need as well no, a novel research financing pathway which means financing system need to be adapted to our agroecological research practices we need the organization of research group according to agroecological research principles so more interdisciplinary research Exchange needs to be much more encouraged, uh, more orientation toward practice. So uh, throughout this approach for living lab or uh, uh, active communication pathways with the practitioner. And finally, the promotion of agroecological research infrastructure, such as, uh, such as in this case, we have a uh, coming living lab and late houses, uh, as well the combination of research and advisory. And I think we finish our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and waiting for your comments and questions.
Thank you very much for all our present presenters. I think we were very glad to have such a diversity of different uh, presentations. And thank you very much uh, for, the, for the, the attendees to send us questions in the comment section. So I, uh, I guess we will go round and I will read out, uh, well, maybe I will read out all the questions you have received. And so uh, uh, you can answer them in one round and then I will go or, or round again, okay? So the first will be to Paola. Um, the former vocational educational and training and formal adult education follow a national qualifications framework, very regulated, agro-industrial knowledge transfer, sectoral disciplinary view. What concrete actions do you introduce systems thinking, experiential learning and transdisciplinarity in formal technical education? Okay, yes, thank you, Lily. Um, for me, it's not 100% clear what is the meaning of formal technical education, if it is high school or if it is the training for, let's say, farmer or technician. Mm, I didn't get it, to be honest. Anyhow, um, both of the either, no? let's say one of the other. Um, of course, there are still a lot of obstacles. On the other hand, for example, for... Um, for, let's say for farmer, there are a lot of um, uh, a lot. There are some uh, very good in initiative, farmer to farmer, campesino to campesino, as well as, for example, uh, a new a new uh, school, farmer school of agroecology in, in Sicily, run by a cooperative. So there are many examples that we can find around the world. Um, I know some in Italy, some in Fr some in France, some in other country of, of Europe. Um, where there is this approach, so that um, there is a, a also for technician, also the the, the um, la scuola di, di, di agricoltura uh, sostenibile in, in Veneto. And so th there are, of course, they're not the mainstream, but there are good examples here and there, and uh, we we need to 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 disseminate more. To, for example, uh, in the Agroecology Europe um, website about education, we are uh, gathering all these uh, formal and non-formal uh, examples. So it's also, so help us to disseminate. Please send us anything you, you know, you want to share uh, among, among this issue. And there is also a, a working group inside Agroecology Europe that is working hard <laughs> on education. Maybe Lily will announce later because we will have also a workshop uh, the day after tomorrow. So let's say uh, I, I don't have a, a unique solution, of course, because it's, a, it's the approach. So we need to to to, to develop uh, a, a safe, you know, and again, it's in my experience, I have learned that it's very much important that the, the, yeah, the, the environment, the methods and the, you know, the people who, who you are uh, working with to do, to do that. So. Thank you very much. If any of our other presenters want to add to this question, just feel free to, to do it now. Otherwise, we jump to the next question. So the next question was, uh, what experiences, as well addressed to Paula, but if any of our other speakers would like to address uh, it, you feel free to do so. What experiences do you know on formal technical education and training, not university-wise, following the next food model? Yeah, it's similar to, to before. But anyhow, in uh, in the next food project, we have developed a platform. Uh, I can also share uh, with you the you can find it in the website. But anyhow, there is the the the, the next food platform. Um, no, I think I, I cannot put in the chat. But anyhow, um, and um, it, it, there there are a, a tool online that you can access. Uh, uh, where there is a step-by-step, -step, you can develop your own uh, program course, uh, one-week course, one-day course, you know, uh, but it's, it's, it explains step-by-step -step, uh, uh, the approach. So, of course, it was also one of the aim of the project is at the end of the project to disseminate uh, and to make practical tools in order that uh, somebody that want to, that have an ID and I don't know, some funding or whatever, anyhow, no, a source of, of and want to, to develop uh, this approach, it's possible to do it. At least we hope so, <laughs> that we have provided enough uh, information. 
Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, and uh, we still have one more question to you, directly to, uh, specifically addressed to you, is uh, whether if the students part of the master's uh, course are planning to work later at the farming sector, or which is their relation with the productive sector at the end? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, indeed. Let's say um, some of them already after a few, no, not, not even a month of the graduation, they are already working in, in, in farms, uh, in, with animal, in, in uh, horticulture, as well as uh, with, they are searching for, for uh, let's say, projects that are related to basically connect pro producer with consumer. No? So any kind of project uh, that can uh, short, shortage no? uh, the, 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 the food chain uh, and uh, somehow uh, apply agroecology and, and food sovereignty. So it could be a, a roaster coffee in in, uh, no, in 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 France or in Germany or in, in Oslo to, that help to connect with small coffee producer no in in the south of the world as well as a, a restaurant that want to to reduce the food waste uh, as well or, or to connect directly with producer as well as I already said there are some of them that work directly in in in, in farms. Thank you very much. And the next question goes to Sarah. Very nice work and thank you for sharing, says the, the person who asked. What kind of activity do you suggest with teenagers like 14 to 11 years old? Or if you could share some experience about it. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you so much for the question and thanks for your interest. Uh, normally from pedagogical aspect, uh, the kids at this age like to discuss. Uh, so they like to work in a group and also individual. Uh, I would suggest some group works. So you give them a topic on uh, agricultural, uh, I mean, agroecological, let's say, for example, uh, organic farming. And then you divide them, let's say, 20 pupils. Then you divide them at four groups. And... Uh, they are supposed to research individually and uh, work in a group and uh, research and work on disadvantages and advantages of organic farming from, for example, uh, a farmer point of view, from a banker, from a decision maker and from consumers. So there are I'm trying to give an example. So there are many methods. And uh, as I try to explain it, this group works. And at the end, discussion, I mean, they go do their research, their work, their group works. And at the end, they present their work and they discuss about it. So this discussion, they like it and they uh, grow up and they learn with this uh, discussion. So. If you need a further explanation or further example or uh, more information, I can leave my email here and you can contact me and I can send you more materials and more methods. Thank so, you very much, Sara. And uh, as Melinda is as well working with teenagers, would you like to add something, Melinda, on your experience? What are the challenges? You are muted. Yes. Do you hear me now? Yes, now perfect. Okay. In uh, in Hungary, that is the, um, generally the situation that, uh, that there is um, uh, most of the teenagers are not aware at all of uh, issues of food security and food sovereignty. And uh, I think it's very important that, um, that this food uh, literacy somehow comes more uh, common. Um, and uh, and um, I don't think it's a short term. It's possible to really integrate in the regular curricula of the schools, um, but um, and also as a part of uh, of health uh, education and nutrition generally. I think it's very much connected. All the issue is with obesity, uh, which is a big problem in Europe as well. All experiences that, uh, or my experiences that, um, that uh, um, you have people who they say so-called they have green fingers, 
Dus uh, these uh, pupils uh, or children, uh, teenager fingers, they We lost you now, Melinda. Uh, oh, who don't uh, go back? Um, do we lost uh, you for a second. I, no, no, now I it's okay, but we, we lost you for a second. We okay. were at the green fingers. Yeah, this the big, I think the big uh, question is the methodological question is that how can you engage those people who are in the majority who don't have a green finger? Uh, and uh, and how can you find uh, activities which uh, are supporting each other, uh, which uh, which are able to uh, help the whole community that they really think uh, and realize the interconnectedness of uh, health and food uh, issues, and how how do you produce food, and what kind of um, uh, activity you can really have. And I think it can be very different according where people live, because in a rural neighborhood, uh, you can have uh, much different uh, education programs than in a city. This it has to be very uh, varied, I think. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. So the next question was addressed to Sarah, but I guess some other presenters will have a few additional things to, to say. So the question sounds like this. Do you work with teachers' education and how do you prepare teachers to work in an interdisciplinary way with colleagues who have a systems view on food? Uh, actually, not yet, but we are planning to. So the teacher, uh, actually the same process, I mean, the same method which you use for the pupils, we are trying to do the same things with the teachers. But I personally haven't got experience yet with this topic. Thank you. Michael and Fatima, you, you mentioned something about this during your presentation. Or at least how to include it more in the research and education framework. Yeah, the, the point was more in the direction, okay, we need to create perspectives where people want to have an education in agriculture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was the main frame, yeah. And what about you, Paola? Do you engage with teachers? Yeah, let's say, um, actually, it's another project, but um, in, in, in two previous Erasmus projects, we have worked, and also in our garden, we have a university garden, we involve also kids uh, from kindergarten and primary school, as well as teacher. So we have also that part. Um, I didn't mention in my presentation, because of course. And, and we have done um, also in the context of... Um, um the project of slow food uh, with uh, with um, no horticultural uh, school uh, no garden um we we trained we trained teacher uh, both uh, on we through the excuse somehow of of knowledge uh, so developing no some uh, some context about uh, soil insect plant uh, but we use somehow um this this um, entry point in order to develop some uh, yeah group work uh, uh, some also again some tools uh, some some space for dialogue and uh, of course it's very it's very like like for every adult so very personal so there are a huge difference among uh, can I say uh, willingness and and uh, no dedication to this kind of project. Uh, so uh, it, it, there is a huge diversity. So there are, um, but anyhow, the, the, some tools, uh, you can start from a little book uh, booklet uh, till uh, uh, practice some exercise, till again, reflecting on, on our, our no, their own uh, food habits or so uh, where do I buy food? No, so to put, to put the, the the teacher in the same in the same connection as we do with 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 kids with students, no, related to ourselves, to our, um, I cannot say ecological education. Uh, Lily, may I? Yeah, sure. Okay. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, actually, I have many hand. 
uh, many booklets, many handouts in German. I don't know if this helps anyone. I mean, I have many materials for teachers, uh, but it's, as I said, it's in German, it's not in English. Uh, so uh, the organization which I'm working in actually send these uh, booklets in the head to the teachers. So they all have a look at it and they all see the methods and so forth and so on. Uh, so as I said, uh, we, we we already have we have some this uh, we have this uh, booklets, but the things is they are in German. Thank you very much. And the next question is addressed to Laia. Uh, the question sounds like this: Is the union working with European partners on information resources, education events, and policy recommendations for food literacy? And uh, I would also like to enlarge this question, whether you know about any similar European uh, initiative like your union? Uh, well, in fact, we don't, we don't work really in, in food literacy. We, we, are in, we are in this issue because it's a social and very important issue so media and journalists we we consider that we have to be there but we we are not special uh, specialist in in this issue but more in the media literacy but we can orient this media literacy in this food literacy so um, we are more in the collaboration for example with the with the Federación uh, de Sindicatos de Periodistas in Spain, the Federation in Spain, and also the European Federation, and even in the International uh, Federation of, of Journalists. Because in this uh, platform, we, we, we defend and we work for the independence and the, 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 the right to work in information and in good conditions information about this issue i mean we we are in fact uh, uh well in our in our union mm, this this issue of food sovereignty or food literacy is more that be because we have uh professionals that are very linked with agroecology and so uh, we know that it is a very important um, main main issue nowadays. But uh, so we we need to uh, sensibilize as well our professionals in journalism to 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 talk about this link between uh, food and climate change or whatever. No uh, and and make it more visible in in news and make it more visible in um, make more 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 visible the the importance of defending our rights as workers in in journalism so i'm sorry to say that no but yes in catalonia in local very local platforms that are working in this uh in this in this uh organizing uh, an agriculture and more 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 food sovereignty and etc we we are giving support but all always from this perspective of right to information because it's our our world no and it's not minor because for example you were talking about the professors no or in in university and the right to information, it's not mm, very known in our world. Even in, in journalists, uh, in journalism faculties or in other, in other, um, uh, in other fields of knowledge, um, it's, it's not, as, as we think, it's not uh, sufficiently um, put it in, 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 in its uh, place uh, about the, the importance of defending it and working in it because uh, as, as I said before, 
if if we don't have this independent uh, information, we cannot uh, uh, work further in defending this uh, right to food, for example, uh, or uh, food sovereignty uh, further. I don't know if I answered mm, your question. <laughs> Well, our uh, attendee will tell uh, will tell us so <laughs> whether you did, but I guess you did. Thank you very much, Laia. The next question is to the to all of you. Considering the non formal approach of campesino a campesino used in Latin America for the agroecology transition, do you know about practices with this approach in Iberia or in Europe in general? So the campesino a campesina or campesino. <laughs> Go ahead, Paula. As I, as I, yeah, I, I already mentioned that, but uh, yes, there are there are some, may, maybe not 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 so many, but there are some also in Europe. First of all, also because um, uh, the, the European network of Via Campesina, it's it's it, it's active in Europe and they offer courses, so it's 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 frequent that they do it. Uh, it's also they are also part uh, um, uh, of of the agroecology for a EU project uh, and uh, inside the work package for uh, all chai let's say the, the the European network of Via Campesina will organize for example three three courses uh, Campesino to Campesino so this is just an example and then there are others there are other association and and as I mentioned only in Italy there are some of them, for example, the one I mentioned in uh, Cooperativa Valdivella in Sicily, or uh, the one I mentioned in, in Veneto, inside Rete Humus, that is a group of, uh, it's an association, group of organic farmers in Italy. They have just carried out a very nice three days. I was not there, unfortunately, but I saw the picture. <laughs> um, a very nice uh, three days, full immersion about soil, soil indicators, uh, biodiversity indicator, and it was a farmer to farmer. So farmers that uh, no, teach and learn to the others. So there are there are examples, and uh, of course there are virtues, uh, not not so common, but but there are there are good ones. I think, Malinda, you would like to add something, right? Yes, yes, yes. That my um, experience in Hungary, at least, uh, that um, um, there is uh, quite a lot going on lately, the last two, three, four years, uh, in a completely informal way. Thus, it's not uh, organized like we are Compassina, and it's not uh, receives any funds. They don't even... Uh, go for any funds probably because they don't know about it or uh, or other reasons, but it's a conformal, co uh, uh, completely informal way. Um, people started to work in their backyards uh, again and making cultivation and sharing practices uh, um, without um, chemicals uh, gardening, and, uh, and it's a big uh, renaissance of it. And uh, I think it would be important to, uh, to know about it. It's quite difficult because uh, really sometimes it's, uh, it's, uh, there are uh, loose networks, uh, really informal connections of people, but who teach each other, they help each other as well, they share experiences. Um, and, uh, and I think it adds, uh, adds to the picture. A really big deal because, uh, uh, in at least in Hungary, uh, if you cultivate the ground on your uh, backyard, that it uh, can be really quite, quite a um, uh, big quant quantity of food which you produce, and um, and that would be important, mm -hmm. I think, also in connection to food security, but also connection that uh, what can people do with the surplus. Uh, and uh, and sharing and and um, all these um, connections, it's um, it would be go good to somehow to incorporate it. Um, and uh, uh, because we have similar traditions, I suppose uh, you have um, uh, similar uh, development in other Central European countries as well. And uh, and it's really would be great if um, if. Um, if in whole Europe we could have incorporating this uh, Central European experiences as well. That is it uh, shortly. 
Thank you very much. So before uh, reading out the last questions, I would like to remind you that there is a poll where you can vote. So it's between the com uh, next to the private uh, to the comments section. So uh, please don't forget to vote. And uh, actually, as we have a journalist with our, us, you can even ask the question yourself because I, you, you asked it and I think it's a lovely question. But if you want, I, as I have already the word, uh, go ahead, Laya. No, thank you very much. Yes, I am sorry. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't avoid to ask you, my colleagues here in the session, no? as we talk about formal and informal education, uh, if you work with media, if, if you have the possibility or how do you do it, to relate with journalists or with uh, journalism in general, and if you can spread your message or your courses, what do you do in by media, or mainstream media or alternative media? Uh, how is it? Thank you very much. And what media are you using as well? I think that would be quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Thank you. May I start? Go ahead, Sarah. Actually, I'm using Facebook and Instagram. Instagram, you can reach more people, especially young people. I post uh, time to time different topics, different meetings, uh, even personal experiences. And uh, uh, actually, uh, I reach people through Facebook and Instagram, mostly Instagram. And I get feedback and comments. And um, for example, the last activity which we did collecting trashes, and we called people, young people, to collect trash in our city, and we got like four, five, six. Uh, but it was okay. I mean, it's uh, still we reached some some people. So I would uh, I would suggest Instagram to reach more people. Thanks. Who would, Paola? Yeah, this more or less the same. Let's say, of course, we have, let's say, within the project of Next, so there are an official, there are a partner that take care of the communication of all the social media, as well at the University of Gastronomic Science, we have a communication office. But it's also true that a lot goes um, through my personal <laughs> Facebook and Instagram page, as well as the student uh, that disseminate the information. Anybody else would like to answer Laia's question? No? Then I read out the last question before reading out the, the results of the poll. So the last question is the following. Is there a way to make both formal and non-formal teaching material open source and accessible? First of all, I say hello to the student of an MBU <laughs> master course. <laughs> Um, and then, uh, again, uh, for sure, the student uh, already know, but there is, for example, the platform of Nextwood where the, the tools are available freely. Um, then, of course, there should be also something maybe more accessible, a European, uh, no, not only a European, that, that, those are, for example, are in English, no? but there is a there is a language issue. Again, what about the Spanish country? What about not? So then how to access that resource in, in uh, national language? That, that could be another, of course, another problem or anyhow, obstacles, no? Wonderful. Thank you very much. If nobody else, nobody wants to add anything on that, I will read out to you the the results of the of the poll. So the question was the following: What is the best way to transmit agroecological knowledge throughout all levels of society? And I don't think I I see all the results. There were only four answers to the question because I don't see it. So the biggest one, yeah, here it is. So the first one, which received fifty eight percent, is replace training programs promoting industrial agriculture with agroecological farming curricula. The second one, with 25%, is improve agroecological research and formal, informal education. The third one, with 8%, is bring agroecological knowledge to primary schools through gardening programs. The fourth one, uh, which receives still 8.3% uh, uh, of, uh, of votes, 
is to integrate farmers and consumers into agroecological research programs. And nobody voted for the expand and promote independent media, ensuring the right to access reliable information, even though it is very important, as we could hear from Laia. So I hope that it, that it changed people's mind. But I mean, unfortunately, everyone could vote only for one thing. So I guess this is why they, it was hard to choose. And as we have only one last minute left before closing down, I would like to thank all our pr lovely presenters for bringing us all these really important information and sharing this with us. So thank you very much for all of you and for our participants as well for staying with us and for asking questions. And before closing down, I would like to remind you that we're going to have uh, in two days, in, on Friday afternoon at 3 p.m., 3 in the afternoon, the working group meeting of the Agroecology Europe um, Education and Training Working Group, where we will continue this uh, discussion on a much more interactive way. So uh, you will have the chance as well to speak up and uh, and share your uh, your experience. So we are looking very much forward to to speak with you there and to exchange with you there. And hopefully our presenters will be present as well, and you can further ask questions and ask about the importance of media. Uh, and uh, last but not least, as an information, in 15 minutes times, the uh, General Assembly of uh, Agroecology Europe is starting. So if you have registered, you, will, you have received a Zoom link, so you have to uh, sign in on that. So it will be on a different platform, not this one, but on Zoom with a different link. So thank you very much and have a lovely day and enjoy the thank forum. You too.